One of the themes this morning is uh, nervousness. and So I'm not nervous because fortunately I don't know Miles. Uh, but I'm going to introduce him and what he asked me to share. Uh, his, uh, his list of uh, events and things that he's been involved in are in the brochure. Uh, but what Miles mentioned to me was uh, that he is a citizen of the Haida Nation and Canada, and he grew up among his people on Haida Gwaii. As you will hear shortly, Miles has worked closely with many different peoples and levels of government over the years in seeking to build a new relationship between the government of Canada, British Columbia, First Nations in British Columbia, and I get the sense your vision is also to speak to all peoples. Um, please join me in welcoming our speaker for this morning, Miles Richards. Well, you're sure making me feel at home throwing the clock out. That's usually how we do it. <laughs> and I never mind it as long as I'm the one with the mic. <laughs> I am Miles Richardson. I am Kilsly Kaji Sting of the Eagles of Joth of the Haida Nation. I'm really honored to be here this morning and I want to acknowledge the Yitka of the Nakoda people in whose place we're gathered today and who so generously welcomed us into their territory and helped us this morning with their ceremonies that we can carry out our deliberations in a good way. I'm really thankful for that. And and really um, have been looking forward to this discussion. I'm here this morning because my friend Stephen Cacfui, who played a similar role a, a few years ago in this conference, asked me to come and, and participate in this conference. And I sit on the board of Canadians for a New Partnership which Stephen is the founder of. And one of our missions, pr probably the most important mission that Canadians for a New Partnership has, is to follow through on the reconciliation piece of the Canada's Truth and Reconciliation effort. And I really look forward to t today as being a part of that. I'm going to tell you my message right from the outset. My message to you is this. Reconciliation between the indigenous peoples of, the, of what we now call Canada, which we all now call home, reconciliation between indigenous peoples and Canadians requires that you, that Canada as a nation state, recognizes who we see ourselves as, as peoples. And that we reconcile that reality with the existence of Canada as a nation state. So recognition, and that's a mutual recognition, because our people have welcomed and, and recognized Canada and reconciliation. I don't, you know, I, we want the reconciliation. We don't want to compromise where we try and make each other like ourselves. I don't want to be you. I accept that you don't want to be me. But I think that we can recognize who each of us are and we can build a society where we can celebrate our differences where we can recognize that most of what we share, what we have, we share in common about this great land that we're a part of, the future that we desire for our children and future generations, but that we have differences also. 
And we just need to celebrate those differences. That's where we need to go. So at the end of my talk, that's what I want you to understand. And I want to have a talk about that. I, you know, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and I want to engage in a dialogue. I want you to understand what I'm saying in regard to that. And I want to hear you and you hear each other on how we might get there. That's the biggest opportunity that we have as people gathered here in Canada. We can make a difference in this world if we can get over this hump. And I really think that, that um, good, I, I trust that Canadians are good people. And I, I want to make this effort because the sooner we get there, the sooner we can, we can all reap the, the richness and the joy and the wonder of, of this land. Look at it. I mean, you open the window in my country and you'll find the different but beautiful places. And you'll find that right across this country. <coughs> to get there, we need to be aware of relationships. You know, that's what um, spirituality is about, is, is relationships. That's what politics is about. It's about relationships. And let's ground them in the truth as best we can understand the truth. You know, we're just, each of us are just pitiful human beings. We don't have the capacity of, of our Creator. We, we can't contemplate what Sinano, Sin Sanawai, in, in my people's way of looking at the world. There's a Creator, which is the, the power of all the powers that is what each of our nations generally refers to the Creator. Since Anawa is so powerful, he stands still and moves at the same time. He's light and dark at the same time. Power that we can't even contemplate as humans. And since Anawa gives power to the humans, to the undersea people, to the forest people, to the sky people, to all of the rest of creation. We need to be aware of those relationships and as we, as we meet here today. So this morning, I want to talk about political relationships. I see I'd speak again this afternoon. I'd like to focus more on spiritual relationships and I'm interested to talk about that. I know that, that um, Pope Francis is just arriving in Cuba and North America as we meet here. Did any of you read his encyclical this year? It was totally amazing and it could have been the indigenous people here speaking. You know what I heard him say in that en encyclical? Is we Christians have been interpreting the scriptures wrong. He said, we've interpreted the scriptures to mean that there's two fundamental relationships to a righteous life. The relationship of man to his creator and the relationship of man to his neighbor. He said, look at the state of our humankind all the catastrophes that are befallen us. We've got something wrong. And he says in this writing, we've missed one. Let's not be hard on ourselves because we missed it, but let's fix it because this is what the scriptures say, he said. He said there's a third fundamental relationship to a righteous life. And that's the relationship of man to the rest of creation. That could have been a medicine man saying that. That could have been a spiritual leader of any of our indigenous nations. And that's what we're saying. And that's what we've been saying is the peace that's missing toward reconciliation in Canada and around 
amongst humankind globally. That's a wise person, that Pope. And I look forward to more of what he says. You know where I heard? That really, when I really heard that for the first time, I was a young man. I went to, I was the only one in, in my community who went to university. I went to university in Victoria in British Columbia. And I got a degree in economics. I came home. Next thing you know, I'm elected president of my nation. I'm president of the Haida Nation. I'm not even 30 years old. And it was tough times. The industry was threatening to cut the last tree on our islands. There was hardly any fish left. And now they're threatening to drill for oil and gas in our oceans, which is our life source. So our elders set us down as young leaders and said, look, we got a serious problem here. Every generation of our nation has met one basic challenge. We've survived and passed our culture on to the next generation. We may not meet that challenge, they told us. And here I am, I'm the political leader. I got to shoulder this. And they said, they're threatening to drill in our oceans, that's the last straw. We've been trying to work out an agreement with Canada on paying us for what they've taken, blah, 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 all the usual land claim type of negotiations. And our elders said to us, you know, let's understand the truth why we are still here as Haida's. We're not here for, because of a check or money from Ottawa or a money from the province. You know why we've been here for 15,000 years? Because of the wealth, because of the richness of our homeland, our life source, Haida Gwaii. And if we're going to survive, if we're going to prosper, we had better protect her. He was saying the same thing that Pope is telling us now. Our elders were telling us the same thing. Is we are all interdependent. What befalls our forest, what befalls our oceans, what befalls our fish, befalls us. Our fate parallels their fate. And if we can't treat them in a respectful way, if we can't follow the natural law that our Creator put here with us, we will perish. That's what we had to deal with. So, imagine, you know, here I am, young president of our nation. We didn't have an army. Would have made things a lot easier. We didn't have a big budget, you know, we didn't have all kinds of public relations um, capacity to go out and convince people. But we sat down and said, okay, this is our homelands. How are we going to live in a respectful way? So at that time, people laughed at us. We put in place a Haida land use plan. I signed it off. I was the president. We pulled a, we did a, we built a, gov a Haida governance constitution behind it. That was 30 years ago. And it's a long story of what's transpired, all the battles and struggles and political alliances. And, but I'll tell you, one, one morning, I found myself out on a logging road on Othley Gwai, Lyle Island, facing down, standing in front of the logging industry on that basis that it was our responsibility to protect our homeland and if that we weren't successful, we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna survive. I'll tell you that I was a bit cynical a small group of us had prepared ourselves to pay whatever, you know, we put our name out there, we we're going to do whatever it took. And I 
expected we were going to have to pay the ultimate price. We weren't going to we weren't going to lead with violence, but also we weren't going to be pushed around. And I didn't think that people cared. I'll tell you that first morning we were standing on that road. The media were flying around in helicopters, but to make a long story short, Canadians and people across this globe came and stood shoulder to shoulder with us for the truth that we're, we stood for. And in 2010, our leader and the leader of the Haida Nation in 2010, Guja, signed a government to government land use agreement with the government of British Columbia, Premier Campbell that put in place the land use plan we drew up 30 years before. Not one inch was left out. So I know it can be done. I know this country can work. And that's why I'm optimistic. I, we've, we've got to find that goodness in all of us, the, the better angels of our nature. We don't have to snuff each other out. I mean, I'm not a threat to you being being a Haida. Just like the Nakoda aren't a threat to you and being who they are. Matter of fact, they're the biggest asset you can hope for in relationship to this place. So I'm from these islands that are off the coast of British Columbia, about a hundred miles off the coast of British Columbia. Our northern shore is 40 miles from the southern shore of Alaska. Matter of fact, half of our nation are Americans. Half of our population are in, in Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska. That's been our home. Scientists date it. That's been our home since our creation on this earth. We were created in Haida Gwaii. We didn't migrate from Africa. We were created, our stories tell us on Haida Gwaii, and the, since the beginning of our time on this earth, scientists have pegged that through carbon dating to 15,000 years so far. The Ice Age only receded 7,500 years ago, so for half of that time we shared our islands with ice. They didn't cover half of it, but that's a long time and you know, you, you Got to wonder, why did our people survive in the same place through all those millennia? I don't think it's an accident. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful, wonderful human story that's recreated all over this earth. And it's those Indigenous people, identity, who we are, is very much about a relationship to place. And our cultures have evolved from the distilled wisdom of living in the same place through great expanses of time. And all we need to do is listen. The wisdom for sustainability, for living right, for being living the right way are there but we've got to deep dig deep down and glean what is the truth that's what our religions try to do you know i don't think any of us pretend think that there's a creator for each of us you know i i, I don't think it's controversial that there's only one creator for humankind for this world and that each of our traditions each of our Religions or spiritual traditions are ways of ways of understanding what the basic laws of creation are and what the way what we need to do to honor them and adhere to them and thereby prosper. Because one thing I know, to the degree that we don't, to the degree that we transgress those laws, we pay. There's no negotiation. We don't have the capacity to negotiate with our Creator. <laughs> to the degree we transgress, we pay. That's what's happening in this earth. We can figure it out as humans. We can figure out a, a respectful place here. 
So when we look forward now to reconciliation, I look back on, on the fairly young relationship between Canada as a nation state and the indigenous people who've been here since time immemorial. And I break it myself down into three phases. When Canada began, and you know, in 2017, we're celebrating, what, 150 years since Canada was formed. It's not, like it's a blink in time, not like just a young country. When Canada began, through the contact with what's relevant here with the British, through the colonial period, and through the establishment of Canada, according to British law, the right thing was done. The right approach was taken. Treaties were made with the indigenous people. That's what Canadian, British and Canadian law required. That before the Hudson Bay Company or the Northwest Company owned everything, the Crown had to come in and make treaties. Plus, you know, the, there was a lot of territory at stake here, and the Crown needed good relations with the nations, First Nations who were here. So they came in and begun and I'm just saying the form was right. Don't get me wrong saying they were all righteous people and negotiated beautiful treaties in a fair way or anything. When I've made the speech before, I've had to spend twice as much time arguing with my friends about that. I'm talking about the act of making treaties on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. That's how we began, and that's the appropriate approach. And then, we moved into phase two. Around the time Treaty 11 was entered into, BC was thinking of joining Confederation, and you know, the Parliament was just getting formed for Canada. Canada changed its mind about that fundamental form of the relationship. That's phase two. Canada decided that Far from honoring their law and recognizing the indigenous people, the nations, they were going to deny the existence of these people and they were going to assimilate them into the Canadian body politic. That became Canada's policy and it remains Canada's policy to this day. Deny, deny, deny any fundamental legal entitlement assimilate First Nations through the Indian Act, through me measures like the residential schools, which we're talking about working our way out from today through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And for most of the last 150 years, that's what's transpired. But while this was happening, First Nations leadership persisted. They said, Canada is a wonderful promise. Treaties are what you must be entering into. Treaties that address our original title and reconcile those with Canada as a nation state. And treaties of sharing and coexistence. Reconciling each other, not making each other in our own image. And then in about the 1970s, the law in Canada, the domestic law, really started enforcing what indigenous leaders had um, been saying and bringing forward. And so today, you know, we have the first declaration in British Columbia of Aboriginal title as not skimpy rights where you can catch a fish or pick a berry when some other, when some Canadian citizen is not using it, but <laughs> substantial title ownership interest in the land itself over large expanses of land, which is what our people have been saying from day one. So the law is pushing us there, but now we as the people the, in First Nations and in Canada 
must breathe life into that. If we wait for the courts to flesh this out, you know, Beverly McLaughlin is a fabulous, visionary, powerful leader, but she's not going to do it on her own. You know, she got a unanimous decision out of the Supreme Court of Canada on that Chilcotin decision. Get, I mean, that took a long, I'm sure that took a lot of effort. We've got to stand up. We've got to stand up as as Canadians, as people who share this place and say, reconciliation are a part of who we are. That's the nation that I am a part of. That's the solution that embodies my values. Not trying to snuff each other out. That's what reconciliation is about. Amen. So I'm just um, putting this information out there with uh, expectation that from here there's a desire and a will to do the right thing, to work, to bring about reconciliation and that we begin today to march as a righteous army. And I, and I say that it sounds facetious. I mean it. That's what Canadians for a New Partnership is about. Because that question Jim asked me when we were coming in here was, can we really throw colonialism off and find a, a mutually respectful way forward in Canada that is positive and constructive for all of us? And I absolutely believe that we can. And I, and I think the way forward is easier than the path we're on now. You know, when, when we look at the societal challenges we have, and even the human, global challenges, that if we recognize indigenous peoples, recognize First Nations as who we are, and reconcile. And it comes down to this. When I talked about the three phases of, of the relationship in Canada between Indigenous people and Canadians, it's really a struggle between two paradigms. And we got to choose which one we're going to support. The one paradigm, the initial one, where we started doing the right thing with nation-to-nation -nation treaties was supporting indigenous nationhood and developing that and reconciling that with Canada. You know, Canada happens to be a divided sovereignty with a set of laws that the federal government is paramount in and a set of laws which are just areas of jurisdiction that the provincial government is parent paramount and we need to sort those out. That's what treaty making is about. And First Nations are going to retain some of those. First Nations are going to retain jurisdictions or lawmaking powers over areas that are essential to who they are. And we'll give up some in the interest of national cohesion. That's the challenge. So the one paradigm is that, supporting, enhancing, building indigenous nationhood and reconciling with Canada. The other paradigm is the one that Canada has built, the colonial one, which is denying the fundamental humanity of First Nations. And face it, the only re Canada's laws are appropriate for First Nations to coexist, to share healthily. It's Canadians who made a decision that First Nations are not humans first, and that First Nations aren't worthy of human rights. And that not only are Canadians going to deny Indigenous people's fundamental legal human entitlements, we're going to assimilate them. That's what residential schools tried to do. We're going to make brown little white men out of them until they're all get rid of that brownness. That's what 
Why? I mean, but that's our choice be between those two paradigms. And we need to decide every day, every moment in these relationships, which one we're going to feed. It's a serious question, and it's a question that every one of us can make a difference in. <laughs>